Welcome to the Transform Sales Podcast, where forward-thinking business leaders come to share their experiences and ideas, learn from each other, and amplify their results together. Hey guys, I'm your writer here with the Transform Sales Podcast. I got my guest, Philip Popov, VP of Partnerships with Next Sales. What's up, man? Thank you for joining the show. Hey, thank you for having me. How, how are you? I, I'm good. Uh, you know, the, the stock market opens in four minutes, so we'll see. We'll see what comes in with the, the CPI reading and uh, with who's winning the Senate. But everything else is great, man. Just just, just rocking and rolling, helping helping listeners navigate um, a, a cloudy market and 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 buy outsource sales services all day, every day, man. So I'm I'm I'm, I'm excellent. I couldn't be better. Where are you based these it. days? Where Where are you right now? Get, uh, right now, I'm in Macedonia. I'm back home. Uh, I, I guess we kind of brief, briefly spoke before going live. I was in I was in Spain and Italy for a couple of weeks, just traveling around. Um, I'm actually I actually booked for like the Thanksgiving weekend to go to Belgium. So, you know, uh, you are just traveling around. around though. What you were saying to me is that there's an amazing digital nomad community. You're able to work, get shit yeah. done, and have fun at the same yeah, time. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean. At this point, I think every every country is catching up on that digital nomad trend. I see people just just uh, not, there wasn't even space in a co-working space that I was at, so I had had to go to a different place. But doesn't a nomad mean you don't know where you're going? Why can't it just be like digital entrepreneur or digital businessman? Why uh, do we think nomad? Let, let, <laughs> let's coin the term. Let's coin the term on this on this podcast. Then. Yeah, people always ask me too. They're like, "Do you have a call center?" I'm like, "I have an office." Um, I think. I think people use their cell phones every now and then. Like, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> it's like they're on Zoom meetings. I don't know. Does it, does it make it a call center because it's a different country? But um, the, yeah, it's, it's I interesting. Think the call center term is like very, very old at this point. We need like oh, it's just weird. new words. It's just, it's just weird, you know. Like, I know, and like also this, people working from home at all times. Like, does call center mean that it's filled up with people who use the phone all day? Like, is that what it means? Or does it? Is it like, where does a call center become a business center? What is a call center become an office, right? Yeah, it's terms are weird. Uh, I, we won't get into that. I used that. to joke. I used to joke like when the pandemic started and every one of us at Next Sales went remote. And I told, and when they asked me, uh, "Hey, are you guys a call center?" I told them, "Well, kind of like a decentralized call center, <laughs> if yeah. you want it like that." Um, but yeah, but funny. it's easier to give people what they want to hear than to educate them, right? You're like, True. "Yes, we're a call center," and they're like, they keep going, and then you're like, you try to educate them, and they're like turned off because in their mind they want a call center. Uh, yeah, I don't know what, it's, they, it's I don't like know what a that really self- means, right? It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, like some people are just like so stuck on what, what they want and they, they don't really view what other things are, you know, in the market in general, like even better things most of the time. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, they want to hire you to get people to focus on your their product and service, but they don't want to focus on other people's products and services. So it's, it's bad behaviors, rewards, bad behaviors. But uh, for those listening, a lot of the audience here that, that listens to our show are either buyers of B2B sales agency outsourced campaigns, services that have either done it before, um, failed, or they did it before, fired the agency, then got an ROI a year later when a big sale came in, they come back, or they're hiring internally and an outsourced agency, or it's the first time ever, right? So the idea here is to be just super transparent and talk about the mistakes that buyers make when selecting an outsourced agency, and also when working with an outsourced agency so that they can listen to the truth and to honesty and, and not feel like, you know, when you tell them the truth about what they should be doing, that you're selling them, right? So just kind of creating this atmosphere where we can just give them the real information in a, a good way to, so that buyers and sellers can can behave with each other. And I, I keep putting this book, Same Side Selling, because when you read it over and over again, it talks about the adversarial buying culture that that is out there. And, and people just lose money when they they think they're negotiating something and finding the wrong agency. And it's it's just a lot of potential out there, right? Where a million dollars of sales could be $10 million of revenue and valuation. So it's not something that, um, you know, we want people messing up on, right? We want to see companies succeeding and investing back in their products and we want to see agencies succeeding. So we'll have to open up with just who you are and how you got into outsourced sales work to begin with. And then let's flow into just the problems that people are, that yeah. you see in the market. Sure. <clears throat> I mean, I was I was always big on reading self development and psychology and and that sort of thing. You know, maybe even a, a bit of controversial take like Jordan Peterson. Um, I love Jordan Peterson. I, yeah. I I mean, you either love him or you hate him. That's what I'm I'm seeing out there. No, no, no. no. That's not true. That's not true. So like <laughs> basically, it's like if you are a liberal, you hate him, and if you're a realist who likes reality, you yeah. you like. Him. 
yeah. they're still kind of part of the world. So that's why I say you either love him or hate him. I personally love him. I follow him every every on every you know social media channel and whatever. Uh, but yeah, I, I was big on reading him, like Chris Voss, all, all of these people that were related to sales in a way. And that was kind of like my mindset at the time. This was back in 2018, I guess, more or less. Um, and how old were you then? I, I was like 21, I guess, 20, 21. And for all those, like that. all those, all those millennials crybabies out there, you know, <laughs> rock, he's 21 years old getting shit done. All right, keep going, man, but I'm impressed. Yeah. So I, I was in general, that type of person to, to go after what he thinks he deserves. So I was with the mindset that it's all up to me if I get good results at something or not. So it, it's not all of those uh, BS excuses on the side. Oh, but this happened. It's not you versus happened. me. It's, it's you're here to elevate me, right? It's this whole mentality <laughs> of you're holding me back versus you're showing me where I want to be. And, and you're, you know, it, yeah, I'm aligned with you, man. Yeah. And I got, go I got you into sales or, or outsource sales. So uh, that got me into, I guess, well, I guess both. Uh, at that time I was living, uh, with my best, best friend, with my best, with my best buddy. And, uh, he started this gig. He, he was literally the first employee at next sales. And when he come home, uh, when he come back home, uh, after a long day of work, he was like, so, so, uh, so inspired. And he, he had so much fun during the work day, you know, like, Hey man, we did some cold calls. I, I spoke with these presidents of these huge multi-million dollar companies yeah. and, and you know that that got me even more interested and more hyped up and i was like begging him begging him okay when there's like, like a new project call me up and like three or four months later it's such a good it, perspective it right instead of like how i got hung up on by a president it's like it's like fuck i had the opportunity to actually talk to somebody yeah. right yeah 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 yeah, yeah. I, just I, different just perspective different grateful. way of looking at the same thing right exactly just just being grateful about the opportunity to to speak with you know those type of people and that eventually we actually baked in gratitude as one as one of the core values at Next Sales. So yeah, I guess that that's kind of like what got me interested into into sales first off, and and you know outsource sales like like we mentioned it, uh, part of it. Yeah, listen, I love it and I respect it. And and for those listening, I'm like you're in a whole different part of the world, right? Like English is not your first language. Yeah, right. It's uh, what's your first language? Uh, first language is Macedonian, so we have a uh, we have a language the here. Greek mix? Macedonia. No, it, it's a, it's a <laughs> Slavic language. Know, yeah. It's a okay. Slavic language, totally, Slavic totally language. different. Yeah, the yeah. point I'm trying to make is that you speak super clearly. You're professionally 25 years old. You started at 21. You were yeah. calling CEOs um, of leaders of companies, and you didn't complain because you knew that it was you were not a victim of somebody hanging up, but you were a lucky person to receive the opportunity mm -hmm. and. I believe that. And I don't know much about Macedonia, right? And I, I, I don't know much about that area, but I know that um, I, I, I know from a high level that opportunities might be harder to come by in those areas where mm. in America opportunities are, we're easier, the people getting laid off now, right? And it's a little tight. And it's, it's nice to see that perspective because um, frankly, a lot of people are, are scared to pick the phone, scared to talk to people. So like here you have oh, Philip, sure. 22 years old in a second language talking to leaders and it motivates him. Cause it should motivate him, right? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, th that that's been something that I've discussed with many people. Like, we're we're lucky here that we know English, just because you know it op it opens up a lot more opportunities than, for example, people in Macedonia who don't know English. They're really kind of like stuck in, in this ecosystem. If you they will. get stuck in the game, right? In the game. Yeah. I, what I learned about first world and third world countries is I live in Colombia now, and I used to live in the States. And what I learned is that it, it's the it's the way that the people at the top get to the top, right? And there's two mentalities. The, in, in Western yeah. world, it's like, let's get people free access and ride their wave, right? In a way, it's like, you got guys like Google who are, uh, Sergey Brin, who's like, I don't know where he's from, but he's from, he's from Eastern European, right? And like, mm. you know, you let the guy in, you let him do his thing, he builds a billion dollar company. How many billionaires do you think Google has made on their stocks? Probably 70,000, right? Um, and so it's like, let's have this open culture and let and ride the wave of the great innovators. And then the, what I've noticed about Columbia, it's more like distract and, and mm. put employment laws that tax 40%. And strong employment laws against buyers, let them fight each other so nobody gets to the top, right? And I now that I see yeah. this here in Colombia, I, I think that's probably the same play you see in Macedonia. Uh and it's, these places it's starting it's like two thoughts. Start. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's, it's like uh, money in fast, money out fast, evolution. The other thing is like, no, let's let it in slow and out slow and hold it, right? Um yeah, yeah. and that's where you get people Agreed. from everywhere moving to America. 
That, that's why, right? It's, it's a common thing. <clears throat> it's a very common thing for Macedonians to to move out, especially in America. Uh, I yeah. mean, my uncle, aunt, and and cousin moved out in two thousand one. Uh, my cousin came back, but 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 my uncle and aunt are still there. They're in Florida, so it's it's a very common. I, I, I think I think that with like the the launch of fintech companies and giving access to just banking fast and quicker, that people will stop leaving their countries and not returning back, and they'll be able to stay and make a difference because that was yeah. fundamentally like why go back if you're stuck in this like quicksand? You know what I mean? Um, I wire money to Colombia, and like they like lock it down because they think I'm a drug dealer. And it's strange behavior because in Colombia, all the wealthy money is from that time period, right? And then what they did is they put all these restrictive laws on the banks and they hurt mm. the general population while all of the people who are in those businesses or were, they got their money in the Cayman Islands everywhere. They're, they're fine. You know, they're like, like they're very sophisticated multimillionaires and they're great and they limited everyone else. And it's like, it's crazy to see, but I don't want to take all the time talking about politics and this stuff. Yeah, Let's talk about we Byron. really got into politics. It's my fault. It's my fault because I, I, I admire and respect um, the youth that works and, and looks at opportunity the right way. So I just got carried away. But what about people listening right now? They're, they're, they're booking meetings on your calendar. What mistakes are they making, man? And be free to be honest, right? This is, uh, yeah. this is an honor zone. Yeah, for what sure. Um, so right off the bat, I would say like expectations. It's the number one thing that I see, you know, either some uh, some buyers have big expectations or they have no expectations. Mm -hmm. And I actually think the, the latter is a bit more complicated because they go like blind in, into the whole thing. They've probably never, never um, hired an, an SDR or a sales development agency in general. And they're kind of confused. Uh, whereas, whereas the people that have big expectations, it's kind of like an uphill battle with them to, to make them, uh, realize that maybe five meetings is, is a huge deal for you. If you have a high lifetime value, you make a lot of money per, per client, you know, you sell yeah. these high ticket deals that, that take a longer sales cycle, um, to, to get closed. So I would say the number one thing is that big expectations or no expectations. I, I, I like everyone. that. First time, first time I heard of that and that way delivered on, on the podcast. And, and it's, it's actually very nice because it's calling out the fact that like, Hey, you know, having high expectations is always a bad thing when buying, right. If they're not realistic, but then yeah. it also really calls out the fair that it's like, well, we still don't want you just because we're going to sell you and close you because you have no expectations. We want you to have the right expectations, which speaks to the nature of the business because the sale is just the beginning and then it becomes the service. So what do you think is a remedy for that? What, what, is, a, what is a remedy that leaders can be doing to their sales leaders or just in general to, mm -hmm. to help people uh, not have high expectations, uh, not have unrealistic, nothing wrong with having high expectations. Unrealistic yeah. is, is wrong, right? Like, can we exactly. get to Mars I mean, half, half a billion dollars? Probably not, right? And if we, we, if someone says the budget's a billion and then goes, well, okay, can I do it for half a billion? You blow up, no one's winning, right? So it's the same thing in sales. You're just not blowing yeah. up in a rocket. What's the remedy? I think I speak for everyone when I say that everyone wants like an infinite amount of meetings where everyone wants to speak with Bill Gates, right? Like we always need to find, okay, who is your particular ICP if you don't know it yet? Um, and let's go out and test, test the market. Let's be scientists and, and tweak the messaging based out of it. Let's, let's, let's get a couple of meetings in, see if they're going in the right direction and then just build up on that. Right. Um, so this is, this is also what I'm listening to is like, it's almost, what you're almost saying too, is that a mistake that buyers make, cause I, I unraveling what you're saying is that not only do they have high expectations and no expectations at all, but fundamentally they typically come when they don't have product market fit, they don't have, um, yep. they're almost in market validation. And Sales what you assets, just said is like, I would say, yeah, like, like no matter what you think you're, you're not at the point, like, unless you're going to hire a hundred SDRs and you're like, you do this, you say this, you do that because we've done this for five years and this is the formula, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you're kind of in this market validation state and expect that the information you get back is actually more or as much valuable as the meetings because you'll never close a meeting if it's with the wrong person the wrong thing right so so basically people are coming in not only without a, without a plan but they're also coming in really not understanding where they're at in the campaign right but would you safe to say yeah. that there's not enough education out there to describe the difference between a market validation campaign and a campaign that is designated for ros return on sales right like they're just like like they're different right 
you're probably living in this market validation campaign for a couple of years until you, you know, really have product market fit. And then once you have this ROS and you're like, then that's the time where you, it's, it's ready to go. Right. And, and most buyers are not in that stage. Yeah, Honestly. for sure. Agreed. And you asked previously about the remedy, what the remedy is. And I, I think, you know, you always need to have, uh, you always need to give a high, high level executive, you know, a range of what, what he should expect in terms of ROI. And like you mentioned, ROS, I think like an ROI uh, analysis in the beginning is a, is a very good tool. I mean, you and I have, have discussed about this as well, we have. right? Just to, j just to ha give them a range. Okay. If we, if you guys have, uh, uh, this product that sells at X value and we're able to, to achieve, you know, 7% connection rate out of that 7%, how many turn into meetings you would see on ROI in, you know, in 12 months, 300%. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's super, super reasonable, super realistic. You know, at, at certain points it goes way higher. You, you know, we've seen companies at 1500 ROI and, and it, uh, maybe even more. I, I need to check with, with our isn't it, isn't right it now. also safe to say that majority of companies that are C, Series A, and Series B, tep they don't even understand that their business model is an ROS on twenty five, on like five years on a customer. We go with like winning by designs class, and yep. like it's like they're raising money to burn money, and the ROS on the forecast is five years, but then they want an ROI on cash. And it's weird because they're telling investors like, hey, we're going to burn a million, but we'll get a million of revenue. That million of revenue is going to be worth $10 million. So it's like, yes. you could spend a million, right? Get no money back on the investment, but get a million dollars in revenue, have $10 million valuation. But like, how often do people, how often do companies actually measure the valuation you generate? Do you ever see that or no? Yeah, that, that's a great point. That was actually going to be my, my second, my, my second thing when, when talking about top mistakes. Uh, yeah, people just think that we're unicorns, right? That if their sales cycle is nine months and they don't, they don't close a deal within the first three months of working with us, they're like, oh, you, this is not working guys. I, I'm not seeing the ROI. <laughs> well, of course you're not because your average sales cycle is nine to 12 months. You, you can't really see, but, and they, they don't measure pipeline. They don't look at the pipeline and see the opportunity right there. And, and we've had clients with, uh, where we had meetings with Nike and Chewy and all of these huge, big, uh, fortune, uh, fortune 500 companies. And mm -hmm. it's, it's kind of, sometimes I think they even turn a blind eye to, to those opportunities, but eventually they will. Uh, they will bring in revenue, right? You know, uh, oh, yeah. a lot of I, believe that, that I, I get calls all the time from people who have fired agencies and I ask them why, yeah. and they said they didn't get an ROI. And I go, why do you call me today? And they're like, oh, I just got a million dollar deal. And we looked back in the, uh, the, the element uh, the, uh, CRM and it was an outsourced sales agency four, uh, three years ago. And I'm like, but didn't you know that? Like, didn't you know that like, like Where the stats show the that like enterprise yeah. sales take, you know, six to 12 months, even longer. Right. I have to say like, like, is it a symptom of adversarial procurement or is it a symptom of lack of education and understanding and fear, or is it both or neither? Um, my opinion is that we kind of live in this fast world where everyone wants everything to be quick, like right now, right now, I, I want, I want this thing right now. So we're kind of maybe primed to think in that way. Like if I don't get an ROI super fast, then it's not working. Um, and I, and I, the next the people that are, on to the next, SDR, on to the on next, the next, next yeah. agency. let me retrain and them all. Just try again. Train them, but on 90 days after I train them, we fire them, start all over again. Cause that's smart. They yeah. do it all the time. Yeah. yeah. And then you burned so much energy and so much, so much time just to, just to get something sticky without, you know, uh, but I, I applaud the people that are patient. Like it's, it takes a lot of courage even to, to be patient in, in this market. Yeah, it takes, it takes patience, understanding, which was just, was just true. So for me, all valuable stuff, right? Not ha unrealistic ROI expectations or no expectations, right? Um, yeah. And then, and then, and then at the same time, just like a lack of edu education on like the real sales process. They have an enterprise product, and they don't even study like the stats of like how long does that take, right? So they're they're coming in focused only on their product and who it helps, not on how buyers buy, right? And and that's that's a yeah. big deal. So tell me a little bit more about, I'm listening right now to the podcast. I want to hire a B2B agency. Who are your best customers? What do they look like from a product type? I'm going to, I'm going to pigeonhole you. I'm going to make you pick between software and sales. You're going to pick one. <laughs> and then we're going to get into 
once you pick one, we're going to get into the, the next ladder. Where's their target market? What's their ACV? And, and who you help the best because we, that's what we want. We're a marketplace and we want, we want the, we want the, the, yeah. 20% of your revenue that comes from the 80% of your revenue that comes from 20% of your best customers to go to you. And we want them listening and going to you. So, so tell us who they are. Software or sales, start there. You got to pick one. Oh man, very, very difficult. Software or the, services, sorry. Uh, I, I'm gonna go with, with software, probably just, I don't know. It, it's something about having a product that, that makes it more sticky to me. Uh, it may be just a personal opinion. You oh, know, you we're people. a service, oh. we're a service type of business. So I understand, you know, professional services is, is its own animal when it comes to selling. Like services um, work. They have high LTVs, they have, but they're, yeah. they're also hard to scale, right? Because if you do really, really well, they have to then hire 20 new consultants, right? So, so you don't have yeah. the supply. That's the real thing, what you're really saying, right? With software, they got a really good product. Bam, 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 bam. You could open a thousand servers, no problem. You get a thousand customers. Good job. You got a ten x ROI, but you might not scale. So I, I know why you pick yep. software. Kind of a trick question. Um, <laughs> uh, now that we're software, what are we? Are we a startup? Are we seed round? Are we Series A? Are we publicly traded? Um, I, I would say all of the above, uh, but there's a certain, you know, uh, all of the above is not a choice on the test. It's not a choice. Well, I, I'll I tell you why. You can talk all of the above. I, I'm bringing you the <laughs> ones you, the best, the ones you bring. Right. Uh, I mean, ideally, we want to work with people uh, or rather companies that have a sales team, like not. Uh, and that's why I say not startups, just because most of the time they don't really have a dedicated sales team. And when I say sales team, I mean account executives, director of sales, you know, uh, people that will actually take the meetings instead of people that will convert at a 20 percent. Yes. And then if yes. you tell them, convert. hey, take you're covering at 10% and they look at the record and see the account executive only followed up two times, they'll fire him versus fire you. That's what you want. Yes. Educated uh, buyer. One of the other mistakes that people make is, you know, j just not follow up on the meetings to close the deals. Um, yeah. So we definitely want to work with, uh, uh, with companies that have a sales team. Uh, no matter if it's in the infancy it's, it's, like, it's hard or... because if you look at like, if you look at like lawn services, right, it's like, it's the equivalent of like, they expect you to load them on and be gone. And then what you really are doing is like, you know, did you water the plant yesterday? Did you, did you, how's the leaves looking? What's the color, right? Like you need yeah. the feedback every day and, and, and that's how it's different. Um, so there, the, so the follow-ups are important, especially if the guy's not coming to your website, he doesn't know he's a problem. You call him, you email him and now they treat him like he's inbound, right? What, how can I help you today? Exactly. What do you need from me? And you're like, <laughs> you're like, what do you mean? You're like, like Philip called me and like did a really awesome job getting me on the phone. Why are you treating me like I'm an inbound, right? So yeah, I actually had a, a very practical, that. very, ha I have a very practical example. Uh, we used to work with a cybersecurity client and the CEO was taking the calls. And at a certain point it was okay because we didn't have too many. Oh, meetings, he was totally Indian, one, wasn't he? Once, <laughs> once we scaled up to three people, he had like two or three calls every day and he couldn't pick up and uh, keep up. And he, he basically canceled half of those and the other half that he took, he didn't really follow up on them. It was just like, Hey, this is us. Here's a, you know, a brochure. You should be lucky to whatever. buy my product for 50 K. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it went like that. And that's why I always say, you know, we, we want to work with, uh, with companies that have a, a sales team. That's yeah. Uh, a good sales team, right? Cause not every sales, sales team is the same. Sometimes founder, yeah. a lot of founders of technology companies, especially cybersecurity, they tend to be more product leaders than anything else. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they're chief product officers, chief technology officers. They call themselves CEO cause they can, they own the company, but then they get on the calls and they just feature dump and they like, I built the best yeah. product in the world and here are all these features. And they never ask a question of like, what business case is this solving? You know, how much, what improvements do you need from this? Right. Cause all they're doing, they spent their whole life building this product. And they're in love with it. And they think that you should be in love with it too. Right. And the guy listening is just like, what's my investment? What's my ROI on your software? Is it faster, cheaper, more efficient? Right. Mm. Um, and, and it's ironic. So, so it's, so basically your best buyers, software companies, series a, they got a good sales team. They got good communication, right? Yeah. Anything else? I um, so I, we mentioned even, you know, big, big companies. We also have huge companies as clients. Um, the reason why I personally don't like working with them is like the internal politics and everything, like, you know, the bureaucracy, it, it takes so long to, to get an approval from, from one person that go, then it goes to procurement, then in legal, I, I, I'm that type of person who, you know, uh, really hates these bureaucracy type of system companies. I've seen it so bad. So it's like too big. It, I love what you're saying because it's nice because it's like no plan. It's basically like they come in and they, 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 they have crazy expectations or no expectations, right? 
they're a business that's either too small or too big. And, too big. and yeah. this is what I want to hear from you, Philip, because you have yeah. a sweet spot right. and you do right really in the well middle. Sweet spot. As, you, know, you know, SMBs, mid markets, right those are middle. perfect. It's where you do very well. And that's as a yep. service company, that is what you should be focusing on because you, you match well with a certain profile and there's nothing wrong with that. Right. I think the tendency for service companies, including myself, when I was one is that you don't want to say no to people, but you would, right. If you knew that every yeah. year you got a hundred customers and a hundred customers could be what you just described, you take it, but you say yes to other people because you're not a hundred percent sure you'll get those hundred customers that look exactly the same. Right. Yeah. So for sure. I mean, job, I, our job with Cloudtest is to get you those hundred customers, right? Because we know that exponentially, yeah. if you keep focusing on it, you'll you'll end up writing a book. You know, too big, too small, didn't plan too much, right? And 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 that's where you'll really see that exponential growth. So with your clients, because that's your sweet spot, man. And and, and you need to double down on that, um, because frankly, you're just gonna get better and better and better and better and better at working with those companies, and you'll become unstoppable. Right. And that's a, that's a very nice place to be. Right. I think series A going to series B, not too big, not too small. Right. Yeah. Taking people from five to 30 million in revenue um, all day. All, all, you know, you'll, you'll have a highly successful agency and, and, and you'll continue to crush it. Um, are people mainly targeting Eastern Europe, Europe, APAC with you guys? Are they targeting the states? Just states. Right now, just, we're, we're just awesome. I mean, North North America in general, so Canada as well. Uh, but that's that. That's what we're focused on. We used to do Europe previously, but it kind of bugs our internal operations because how we're set up, it's not like we're outsourcing a person, but outsourcing a whole department. So you also have yeah. management overhead. You have we have the sales operations manager roles it baked in to to the offering, the the SDR manager, the customer success manager. So all of those, all of those people need to need to work together to, to get success. And, you know, it's easier if you have one person and he can, you know, work in, in European time zones, but it's way more difficult to, to have four people. Dude, I love what you're zone. saying because you're, you, 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 US software companies, series A, you got a good sales team. You're not too big. You're not too small. You don't have crazy expectations, but you have expectations. Like I'm sorry, but there are thousands of companies that need your help in that sweet spot. Right. And yeah. my assumption is that we don't need to get into it that based in Estonia, that your, your cost might be, your cost might be effective, right? You might have a little bit more of a cost effective. You don't sell on price because we're generating revenue, but you know, I would assume that you guys also are an option for companies like that, that you know, could get a, a little bit of a better rate than, than potentially a, a US based agency just because of cost of living standards, yeah. right? Don't expect something totally crazy, <laughs> but a little bit probably, sure. but maybe not, right? Because it all depends on what you deliver, um, which is great. That, so that, that yeah, US versus the rest of the world debate has always been stupid to me because how, how do you know? Okay, the language, I get it. Like people in the US probably speak better English than, than someone from France or whatever. Uh, yeah. But how do you know, how do you evaluate their skill set? How do you think that someone in the US is better at sales than, than me or, or that person from France? And you know why, why, why does that America, justify? I mean, you live yeah. in America, it's all gravy, but if you don't, you're somehow a stranger. I know people yeah. always say to me, like I'm in Columbia, they're like, you wouldn't hire Columbia. I'm like, I'm in Columbia, you wouldn't hire me. I'm like, I just sell a hundred million dollars of software sales in, in three years. <laughs> well, what's wrong with me? You know what I mean? And it's, and it's this weird concept that America is a melting pot. You can be anything in America, but you can't be anything elsewhere. Strange. Yeah. Those days are those days are numbered. Um, it's part of just nationalism, so right? Huh? Uh, yeah. I mean, we have the internet, and previously maybe it, maybe it was more. It, yeah. You know, no, it, it, it was, was more like that. that. They changed everything on top of its heads. I'm like, look, why the, you you want to live in New York City, make a quarter million dollars, and be broke? You you make thirty five k here, and you're a king. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, <laughs> but like they have to tell you these things because they can't have everybody leaving America. You know. They can't have people going and getting right. beautiful houses in the hills of Macedonia with, with uh, mansions and help and, and living a peaceful <laughs> life. No, they need them stressed out. They need them sick. They need them paying big pharmaceutical companies. It's right? a we gotta, game, I guess. We gotta have inflation high. Right. You gotta get people stressed out. We gotta give them antidepressants. This is part of the business of America, man. Um, yeah, and it, from it's what like I everyone, see... Everyone's got their game, right? America, the other world slow things down. They play this game. America plays the game fast, but you know, everything there's a medicine for, you know? It's, it's interesting, yeah. right? Yeah. Right, um, right. So, so this is great. I appreciate it. I appreciate you being on the show. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I am what you described. Where can I find you? Are you, what's the best way to meet with you guys or to with you? Tell me the channels, LinkedIn, Instagram uh, website, where can they reach out? 
LinkedIn. I, I always say LinkedIn. I just love LinkedIn. Maybe it's turning into kind of like the Facebook of the business world lately with yeah. everyone just sharing their crazy stories for some apparent reason. I feel um, like it. But, but yeah, I, st I still like it. I still think it's a very valuable network. I mean, if you follow the right people um, and the right companies, there's like huge, uh, huge education out there. Uh, so LinkedIn, first, first and foremost, yeah, you know, everyone is welcome to, to, to look at our website, nextsales.io. Um, we have, that's, that's one thing. And the alternative, alternative is our reps will reach out to you. <laughs> We're running yeah. campaigns for next sales as well. Find, if you don't find Philip, <laughs> he will find you. He will find you. <laughs> I, I, I love that's that. True. As you should, as you should, you're an expert. Yeah, it's, you're an expert it's, in finding the right performers you can help. Yeah, we, we take doing our own medicine, job, right? You do your job on behalf of the people, the same job. I'm the same way, man. That's how we build Cloud Task. Uh, this has been great. I, I, I look forward to seeing your agency grow. I look forward to seeing you guys in Columbia and meeting you guys personally. And I look forward to you guys being on our, our summit that we're hosting this year that I'm uh, going to announce the date sometime in January, February. I haven't figured it out yet. Um, everybody listening, this is the Transform Sales Podcast. Check us out, cloudtest.com. You can reach me, Instagram, I'm your writer, Facebook, I'm your writer. I'm on the channel. Unlike Philip, you can get me anywhere. Maybe TikTok soon. I'm trying to use it. I don't know. Doing, <laughs> doing something for sales freelancers, getting them in the world. Um, and and thank you for, for, for tuning in, guys. Philip, man, have a good day. Keep crushing it. Yeah, thanks, Samir. This was great. Talk to you soon. See you. Got it.